to have so many people out tonight. Thank you so much for coming out on a, on a Tuesday night when you surely have plenty of other good stuff to be doing. Um, I'm kind of a one-man band tonight because I'm introducing, I'm performing, and I'm here to represent the Glass House. For those of you who don't know me, this kind of feels like family night because I know so many of these wonderful faces that are, uh, that are here in the audience. Um, I'm Hillary Lewis. I'm the chief curator and creative director at the Glass House. Uh, and this is part of our Glass House Presents programming that we do with the library. So thank you to our friends at New Canaan Library for making this uh, such a, a wonderful program that we are allowed to participate in. Um, my, my colleagues at the Glass House, some of whom are here this evening, uh, always like me to remind you that we have a couple other programs coming up. We are coming to the end of our season, but of course we have tonight's program. Thursday, I'm afraid, is completely sold out, but we have the architect Tom Kundig. Some of you may have already gotten tickets for that. I apologize that due to fire code regulations, I'm not allowed to expand that. That's gonna be at the Glass House. Um, and then in New York on November 15th, we are along with the Center for Architecture, which is part of the AIA in New York, are doing a program um, that's kind of coordinated with the current exhibition that's at the Glass House, uh, which is a slightly academic uh, a project of uh, a, a queer reading of the Glass House, um, looking at it from a, from a social perspective, um, and this is part of our programming that relates to the 50th anniversary of Stonewall and the history of LGBTQ at the uh, Glass House, and that's on November 15th in New York. Um, one other thing to, to mention, which is not actually one of our programs, so it's not yet on our website, but it will be posted soon in coordination with our friends at Sotheby's. I'm gonna have the pleasure of speaking with the director of the Farnsworth House, also a National Trust property, um, as well as a name that you probably have heard of, Mr. Paul Goldberger, at Sotheby's, he was going to be speaking about the work of Paul Rudolph. So in essence, we're going to be looking at Philip Johnson, Mies van der Rohe, and Paul Rudolph. Uh, that should be a very interesting evening, and that's on Monday, December 9th. Uh, so that should be promoted uh, publicly, and I believe that, uh, I don't think there's a charge for that, but I think you may have to make reservations in advance. So should you be in New York and you're not completely sick of me after the next hour, uh, we'd be delighted to have you there. And that will round out our season. Uh, then we're working, of course, on planning for 2020, and so I look forward to presenting new things to you then. So without further ado, you kind of, I think you already know enough about me, apart from just to mention, for those who aren't familiar, I did spend over a decade working directly with Philip Johnson. So the program tonight, uh, I'm gonna be giving you some history, but I'm obviously, as I, I want to do, I'm gonna mix in a lot of information coming directly from Philip Johnson. I've got some good quotes. Uh, as eloquent as I may ever believe that I may be, I can never compete with Philip Johnson. So I just wanna make sure that we've got some good stuff to present to you. So just to start off, just kind of give the framework, uh, we're talking about the furniture collection at the Glass House and its relationship to the history of the Bauhaus and its Bauhaus legacy, um, but also kind of thinking about that in terms of architecture and also in terms of the placement here in Connecticut. I mean, given where we are, I was thinking about that as I put this talk together. So there's a lot of different elements there. I just have to take a quick read. Again, I, I know how knowledgeable so many of you are, but. Is everyone familiar with the term Bauhaus? Yes, good. So I will describe, but just in case for anybody who's not completely familiar, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But of course, you know, the, the great school of architecture, uh, design, uh, and art at, um, in Germany that was open from 1919 to 1933. So that's the reference point. And we are celebrating worldwide, the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus. Again, it opened in 1919. Um, so in 2019, there's a worldwide celebration. So this talk is essentially part of that. So again, that's, where we're, that's what we're doing. Starting off with one of my favorite pictures. And I've, as usual, I wanna give the first uh, uh, statement to Philip Johnson. In terms of talking about this furniture again, almost all of it is designed by Mies van der Rohe. So kind of the uh, underlying theme is the relationship of Philip Johnson to Mies van der Rohe. So just kind of to throw that out there as well. And Johnson said of his relationship, this is writing in 2001, an essay that I had the pleasure of co-writing with him, uh, which was for publication. He says, I don't know why people think of me as a Miesian. Yes, I worked with Mies. And again, that's Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. 
wrote about Mies and exhibited Mies's work at the Museum of Modern Art, but there's a big difference between my architecture and Mies's. The home I built in New Canaan, Connecticut in 1949, the Glass House, is often compared to Mies's steel and glass Farnsworth house, built the next year in Plano, Illinois. This is ironic, because Mies refused to stay at the Glass House. I'm not sure I even realized how much of a departure from Mies's work I had made, but I had. My house was based on traditional architecture in a way that Mises' work never was. By the way, that could be a whole nother lecture. Well, maybe we'll do that next year. <laughs> the glass house has a classical, even Georgian quality. Boy, that's going to raise some questions. This is due to its layout. Each side of the building features a door at the center. Anybody who's been on a tour with me knows I always point that out. My interest in English landscape architecture was also clearly on display. Mies accused me of inconsistency, which was a negative to him, but not to me. So that gives you some kind of just a little preface, a little preface. This is a quote from Johnson talking about, you know, why did you use the furniture that you have in the glass house? And he said, use the masterworks. Why reinvent the spoon? And I think it's important to think about with this furniture, which so many of you have seen, not only at the glass house, perhaps in your own home, maybe at the doctor's office, your lawyer's office, your wealth manager, anything like that. I mean, this is, it's elegant furniture that we have now seen uh, on, on display for, for more than since mid-century. Mid a lot of this design comes from 1929. And so we're so used to it that you think of it as being a classic. Part of the point of this lecture is to understand that the works that we have at the Glass House, the lion's share, don't come from a Knoll catalog, and they don't come from mid-century. They come from an early collection of, of furniture that Johnson uh, received in 1930. So in essence, this is contemporary design that Johnson acquired. And just looking a little closer at the chairs, you all know these terms, right? Those are Barcelona chairs. You think, why are they called Barcelona? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that. A lot of you will know the answer to that. And of course, there's the Renault chair. There's both a flat and excuse me, and a, and a tubular version. And why is it called a Bruneau chair? Well, again, we'll talk more about that, and forgive me, I know a lot of you know the answer to that question. And just, again, to point out, sure, you can buy all this at Knoll. Knoll's a fabulous company, and I remember interviewing the president of Knoll, the former president of Knoll, uh, quite a number of years ago about the whole history, and he talked about how the quality of the steel was different uh, in the post-war period. Noel acquired the license for this furniture back in, I think it was 1947 or 1948. But he could tell when he looked at that which was fabricated in Germany. It had different wells. It had just a different quality to the steel. And that is the furniture that we have. So as much as we're so used to seeing this, I want you to kind of pull yourselves back and think about what it was like when people first saw this, and it was completely something new and exciting and different, and maybe for some people, completely strange. Uh, for, again, mo I imagine almost everybody here has been to the Glass House. I'm not going to scold anyone, but if you haven't been or you haven't been recently, <laughs> we still have some tickets available for November, and, uh, and we, otherwise we'd love to have you come back next season. Uh, the table that you're seeing is a leather top table, also designed by Mies van der Rohe, the t and the chair, again, the tubular steel version of the Bruno chair, and this was essentially Johnson's office space within the glass house. And there's a little close-up, ready for its close-up, looks very nice. And an MR table, those tables were originally designed in 1927, uh, and again, Johnson acquired this in 1930, and there's gonna be much more on that coming up. Uh, a lamp, which was originally designed 1923-1924 by Wilhelm Wagenfeld, uh, and one of the few things that's not designed by Mies van der Rohe that was part of that original collection uh, that Johnson acquired. But again, not for the glass house. It was originally for his home in New York in 1930. And you can do the math. Johnson was born in 1906, so at a whopping 24 years old, Johnson had commissioned Mies van der Rohe to design his rental apartment in New York, his first apartment following his graduation from Harvard. And again, just to give a little sense of the context, again, many of you live in homes that look a bit like this, but of course, this is uh, those same Bruno chairs, the, again, the flat arm version. Uh, the table is designed by Philip Johnson. It's a later work uh, paired with uh, 
a wonderful piece of art by Ely Nadelman, uh, and, a, and as Johnson would say, my very expensive wallpaper, uh, meaning the extraordinary landscape here in Connecticut. So it's very much an Americanized version. But I just want to talk a little bit more about Johnson. Johnson, of course, you know, we think of him as an elder statesman. Here he's photographed in 1993. Take that back. Yeah, that's, I think that's from that shoot. There's a later shoot from 2001. And so he's, a, he's here about 87 years old, um, looking quite nice and dapper and very urbane. But, you know, people forget, you know, he did start off as a kid. He was born in 1906. <laughs> Some of you have heard me talk before, I've shown this picture before, but I think it's important because it's very hard sometimes to think of Johnson as having grown up. And I would argue it's a similar thing of thinking about Barcelona chairs as being something brand new. Uh, it's just hard to kind of put yourself back in that place. He came from, again, those of you who've heard me lecture before on this subject know that Johnson came from a well-to-do family, a very sophisticated family. Uh, his mother collected art, was interested in design and architecture, so he was quite fortunate uh, in terms of his upbringing. And here is Johnson in about 1930 in Berlin. Johnson took a little extra time to graduate from his undergraduate program at Harvard. He was there from 1923 to 1930. And you say, hmm, that took seven years. <laughs> and it wasn't because he was stupid, I can assure you. He studied philosophy and classics. He read Greek and German before he uh, arrived at Harvard at 17 years old, uh, but he took a little extra time. He suffered from depression, and in the 1920s, the cure for depression was to go home and rest. Uh, so he actually used his time quite fruitfully. Uh, he was a very wealthy young man, not just because he came from a wealthy family, but his daddy had done some early work for some little startup called Alcoa, and uh, the stock was placed in young Philip Johnson's name. Therefore, he, by the time he was 17 and off to Harvard, he was a wealthy young man and he could travel to Europe, which he did frequently, and he took a car with him by steamship. That made him very popular. He could drive people around. So he, you get a sense of what Johnson's life was in 1920s Berlin. There were major visits, 1925, 1926, 1928, 29, 1930, all of which led up to his expertise in architecture, uh, which led to his work at the Museum of Modern Art, again, more on that, starting in 1930. So his first job graduating from Harvard is to come to the Museum of Modern Art and to be the first curator of architecture, which he had not yet studied officially, but he had traveled around Europe and he'd seen a lot. And here he is with the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Alfred Barr and Alfred Barr's wife uh, on vacation in Italy circa 1930. So you get some sense, again, what he looked like as a young man, very dapper. Of course, Philip Johnson in the center, Alfred Barr on the left. But now we've come up to the Bauhaus. I just want to talk a little bit about that. Actually, well, forgive me. I've got to go back to Mr. Barr. I got too much, too excited with all my details. But just some, a quote from Johnson dated November 1929, talking about finding out that Barr, who was a young architectural historian, art historian, excuse me, um, who was teaching at Wellesley, uh, had just gotten this new appointment for a brand new institution called the Museum of Modern Art. And he says, Johnson, I don't think I've ever had so much good news all at once. Of course I've known for months of Barr's appointment. I'd rather be connected with that museum, and especially with Barr, than anything I could think of. I will have to learn something in a hurry, though. And he's writing that to his mother in his usual kind of self-deprecating style of, well, what do I know, my goodness. But, and just after that, Barr asks Johnson to come in as the first director of architecture, first curator of architecture. Now, part of their, his training, so to speak, in terms of his travels was visiting some newfangled thing called the Bauhaus. Now, what you're looking at right now is the original Bauhaus, which was in Weimar. Uh, eventually, the Bauhaus in 1925 moves to Dessau, also in Germany. And uh, it is, um, it's just important to re remember that the original building was not something that was as iconic. Founded by Walter Gropius, so the great architect, who brought together all different disciplines of art, design, architecture, textiles, etc. And in 1925, he moves uh, from Weimar to Dessau. 
building the iconic building of 1925 to 1926. And Johnson writing about this in terms of his, and this is contemporary writing, he says, this is one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. By the way, he's writing this in uh, late 1929, but it was October 1929, his first visit to the Bauhaus. This is one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. You must see it someday. Again, it's a letter to his mother. We happen to have notes like this because his mother saved his letters. Other people might not have saved them. We are reveling in having reached our Mecca at last, though we are only giving two days to it. We're going to see Gropius when we get back to Berlin. So clearly Walter Gropius wasn't in residence at that time. And he goes on, he says, of course our main interest there was that marvelous place, the Bauhaus. I might even get excited and go there sometime, meaning study. The students look very interesting, and the very idea of working in such a magnificent building thrills me. Anyone between 17 and 30 can go into the place, and for the first semester, everyone takes the same work. General and, um, aesthetics and practical work with wood, paper, etc. The greatest man there is perhaps the painter Clay. He's referring to Paul Clay. By the way, Johnson was the first American collector of Paul Clay. Most, almost all that work is now at the Museum of Modern Art. Some of, which, some of whose works are a bargain. They run about $200. Now in 1929, $200 is actually quite a tidy sum, uh, but nonetheless, it shows that he's already thinking about collecting. He says, what strikes me is very cheap, but there are so many to choose from that I find it hard to get anything at all. I bought quite a few lighting fixtures there, which you may like. He's again writing to his mother. I haven't the slightest idea what to do with them, but I shall use them for an exhibition of what the modern work is like here. He's already thinking about this, and again, this is in 1929. And I just wanna show you a picture that you may know well. The, uh, it's known as the Bauhaus um, stairway or staircase in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art from 1932, painted by Oscar Schlemmer. Schlemmer was someone who taught at the Bauhaus, was in charge of the theatrical program there. This was acquired by Philip Johnson and then later donated to the Museum of Modern Art, and it's considered a seminal part of the permanent collection. And uh, it's an interesting history. This is painted in 1932. The Bauhaus is closed by the Nazis in 1933. By 32, it's already clear. Gropius has already left. Hannes Meyer has taken over, and then Mies van Roo comes in to lead the program. It's kind of clear that the writing is on the wall, that the Bauhaus's days are numbered. So in truth, when Schlemmer is, is painting this, he's actually looking back at the heyday of the Bauhaus and portending uh, what is sadly into the future. Uh, and again, Johnson writing about the history of the Bauhaus. He says, it was a glorious scheme to unite the arts, the modern movement of them under one group who could work together and exchange ideas. And such a place it was, occupying an inspiring building and with the best of men in all its branches. So it gives you some sense of Johnson's reaction to the Bauhaus and the importance of it, of bringing together again, Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, later Marcel Breuer, Paul Klee, Vasily Kandinsky, an extraordinary array, the Albers, et cetera. But on to Mies, a, a younger photo of Mies. Some of the pictures are much older. We've got one a little bit later on in the talk. And Johnson, of course, meets Mies starting in about 1929, 1928, and uh, becomes quite enamored of his work, and Johnson says of his early meetings, of course I was a big supporter of Mies van der Rohe. And mind you, of course, it's, he's really Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, but almost everyone referred to him as Mies. I first met Mies in Berlin in 1928. I was not yet an architect, but I was interested in architecture. I recall he described my visit to Berlin as the quote unquote, American invasion. His work impressed me far more than that of Walter Gropius, head of the Bauhaus. Mies was an artist. The elegance of the work stood out among that of his contemporaries. He really means Gropius. I visited Mies during several trips to Berlin and later at the Bauhaus. Soon my work at the Museum of Modern Art as the first director of the Dep Department of Architecture would bring me in greater contact with Mies. My travels to Europe beginning in 28 and in particular in 1930 provided much of the material that Henry Russell Hitchcock and I, and I believe I got a picture of, oops, no, sorry about that moment, um, provided much of the material that Henry Russell Hitchcock and I would later exhibit in 1932 as the international style. Of course, you know that book, and that was originally the exhibition that was called um, in Modern Architecture International Exhibition. Mies had already done marvelous designs in Germany, which we exhibited. 
And to give you an example, I mean, this is from 1927. This is the Weisenhof Siedlung or the Weisenhof uh, uh, housing development in outside Stuttgart in 1927. So this was all brand new. We didn't have stuff that looked like this yet in the United States. And I think I just want to uh, just add one important element kind of to structure our thinking about this today, tonight, um, that modern architecture at the Bauhaus and overall mo the modern movement was a reaction to World War I. When we think of so much of the modern um, uh, design that we have here in Connecticut and in the United States overall, it's actually a reaction to World War II, and it's a much more optimistic one. In World War I, of course, known as the Great War at the time, no one could have foreseen that World War II would be following it so soon. The reaction was so much had gone wrong, so much was devastated, that we must try a completely different approach to society. And so that's where this architecture is stemming from. By the time we get to the post-war period in the United States, it's about something else. It's really about kind of the rebirth following the war and the use of new materials and reinterpreting what was done in Europe in the uh, interwar period uh, and turning that into something that is very much American. So again, more on that later, but I just want to throw that out as, as background. Philip Johnson in 1932, the exact year that he does the um, international style um, show. And again, I had just read to you about the, and no, it's hard to believe he did not have the glasses yet. That's, I see you shaking your head. And I'll tell you just a funny story about that. You know, Johnson's glasses, I forget, it's either 1933 or 1934. You know, he's already visited, he, he gets the glasses. And you say, well, where does he pick them up? You know, a lot of figures are wearing glasses like that. Le Corbusier has glasses like that. Uh, Picasso has similar glasses. Uh, Johnson decides that he wants to design his own that are even more perfectly round. And Johnson, who's not a poor man, um, saunters into Cartier and, and, and brings in his design, and they fabricate these for him. And I remember the first time I heard this story, I said, you walked into Cartier? And mind you, we're talking, it's either 1933 or 34, and he said, well, they weren't busy. <laughs> yes, it was the Depression. <laughs> Amazing, I know. And again, the aforementioned Henry Russell Hitchcock, Johnson was lucky that he just happened to have gone to Harvard. You know, it brought him into contact, and again, some of you have heard me speak on this subject before, if you heard me say this in the past. It brought him into specific contact with a number of scholars who happened to be connected to Harvard. So that's where he met Lincoln Kirstein, who was an undergraduate with him. Uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock has his, his doctorate from Harvard. I, I gotta double check, but I think his undergraduate as well. And um, uh, the great Alfred Barr, Princeton undergraduate, PhD from Harvard, they're all kind of floating around. Uh, that, uh, so that's part of the, the interconnections that are helpful. Johnson, in truth, meets Hitchcock because uh, Alfred Barr introduces him to Hitchcock. And together, of course, this is one of the, the early shots of the show of 1932, the international style. Now, mind you, the picture you're looking at features the work of Le Corbusier, Villa Savoie, it's not Mies van der Rohe, but I assure you, work by Mies and others from the Bauhaus were prominently displayed. And of course, it, it originally is uh, featured as a catalog and later becomes the book that so, much, so many of us read in school, or at least thought we had read in school. I have to say, when I came out of graduate school for the second time, I realized that only one class had made me read that book. And I often give talks where I'll say, well, you all know about the international style. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Have you read it? And the room gets so quiet, because it's rarely assigned, which is sort of interesting. This was for the, I think it was the 60th edition uh, back in 1992. And one of the images that were featured in that was a home for a young man which had been designed by Mies van der Rohe in 1930. Of course, this is Philip Johnson's own apartment. And it's, again, that's, I gave you the backdrop. Johnson's rented an apartment on East 52nd Street. Alfred Barr has an apartment in the same building. It's now a beautiful co-op uh, just off of uh, Beekman and Sutton. And, but it's a fascinating thing that Johnson has already uh, decided that, and here, again, 24 years old, that he's not only going to be taking over his, his duties at MoMA, but he's going to hire Mies to design his apartment. And he says, I graduated from Harvard in 1930 and moved to New York. He's writing this in 2001. It was Mies who designed my apartment at that time. What is probably best remembered about his work in my apartment is the furniture, because he, in truth, also the curtains and whatnot, that's all coming from Mies' studio. Mies designed a leather and chrome daybed. And those of you who've been to the glass house, especially if you've been there with me, you know I almost always point out what's known as a Barcelona daybed. If you go to the 
Noel um, site, it'll say the Barcelona couch. That always drives me bananas, because Johnson would never have used the term couch, but it's out there. Uh, but nonetheless, that was designed for Philip Johnson. So it's important to think about what we have as the prototype. And again, more on that later. Mies designed a leather and chrome daybed for the apartment, which was later commercially reproduced. Boy, was it. I still have it along with other pieces he produced for the project. I also have two Barcelona chairs. And just a little a quick image, this was of the bedroom. That um, uh, cabinet that you see at the end, that wooden cabinet, is now in the collection at the Glass House. We actually displayed that not long ago at the Gray Art Gallery at NYU, which did a show on Philip Johnson and Alfred Barr. The table next to it, what's known as an MR table, designed in 1927, and that very, very simple little bed. And here's another over overview of the apartment. And again, seeing that day bed at the base. I don't know if this works. Let's see, can I? No? I don't think that. Can I, can I, you know, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> Are you guys old enough to remember Carol Merrill? That kind of reminds me. Here we go. Yeah, somebody remember that. Showing my age. Um, and just speaking of the apartment, he says, there's one other matter which I'm, oh, he's, he's, this is Johnson writing to his mother in 1930. He says, there's one other matter which I must talk over with you. There is this very great architect, he means Mies, here who does the best interiors in the world. Do you think it would be too much expense to let him do my apartment? The furniture plus duty, because you'd have to import it, would not cost as much as Desky, and he's referring to Donald Desky. Some of you will know that name, one of the great figures of interior design and uh, furniture design of the deco period. Um, and, and Art Modern, uh, not as much as Desky, anywhere near. I have found that out, and it would be for the first room entirely in my, using the possessive, in my latest style in America. He's writing this in early 19, excuse me, late 29. Wire me if you think it's out of the question. I think it would be the cheapest possible kind of publicity for my style. So here he is at about 23 years old, and he's already thinking about publicity. It's fabulous. The whole will be elegant, but so simple. That's right. It would take me all night to describe just what it would be like, and then it would not do it justice. And while I think of it, those German fixtures, meaning the light fixtures, work very well in American sockets, only they have to be rewired by an electrician. I know someone in Hartford who has them already, and they work well. So it gives you some sense of his practicality. One thing I want to point out is that the table that you see at the center, and again, is known that is, it's, that's not a random table. That is designed by Mies. It's known as the Krefeld table. The one thing that I have not been able to figure out in terms of its actual year, in terms of acquisition, is the Barcelona table, the glass table that we have at the glass house. We actually have two. We've got a spare, which is on display right now, and then the original. Um, because the early apartment does not have the glass table. It has the table that you see there. And he also is writing again to his mother, and he said, Mies has hardly started on my apartment. Alfred worries that the doors and moldings in our apartment are bad, and to replace them would cost $450. In 1930, that's a hefty sum. He says, I'm against it, though uh, he thinks that with Mies furniture, it would be worth it. I disagree. I'm getting quite a few extra Mies chairs, which are the best and most popular here, so you can have some. And again, that was to his mom. Might bring home a few chairs kind of amazing. And just to give you some sample, again, of, I'm just going to take you back here. You see that little piece right here? Of course, that is the small um, uh, uh, stool, leather top stool, that we have in our collection that is now placed in the bedroom. Uh, this is carefully placed for the photographer to take that shot. But nonetheless, you get a sense that, I remember saying to Johnson, good Lord, you commission Mies in your 20s to design your apartment, your rental apartment in New York. And he said, I said, my goodness, such an extravagance. He said, well, I got a lot of use out of it. And he did. He used it for 75 years. <laughs> and there's the daybed. That, and, I, and it is, and Johnson always called it the daybed. And I'm going to explain why I don't call it the Barcelona daybed, even though everybody else certainly does. It looks like a Barcelona chair made into a daybed. And I will point out, because I have to do this for my colleagues may appreciate this. You see there's a little, little rip right there. I'm always on the hunt for funds for conservation. <laughs> We are, don't worry. As soon as the season's over, we're going to be, re we're going to be working on um, uh, repairing some of the leather that's in our furniture. We are constantly working on that. But again, that's the daybed. And of course, the Barcelona chairs. 
Um, and if, just to, now to give you proper background, why are they called Barcelona chairs? Again, I know how knowledgeable this crowd is, so you know they pro that they were related to the Barcelona Pavilion. But for anyone who's not that familiar with it, the Barcelona Pavilion was designed by Mies van, van der Rohe in 1929 for the World's Fair in Barcelona, hence Barcelona Pavilion. And this is it in its original form, and this is it as it was reconstructed. It was designed to be a temporary structure, and therefore, um, it was torn down after the World's Fair. Be still my heart, my goodness, you know, carrying out a building by Mies. And what's fascinating about it, if you look at it, of course it's so simple, and it must have been just shocking in 1929 to see a building such as this in a place that's as ornate and fabulous as Barcelona. Look at just, my God, just look at the way that the stone is cut. It's amazing. But I just want to point out the chairs. You'll see two Barcelona chairs and two Ottomans. You do not see a daybed. And I remember one of my professors when I was in grad school lecturing us on this. And he said, you want to know why there's no daybed? There's no daybed, A, because it hadn't been designed yet. But even more important, the chairs are there so that the king and queen of Spain could, be, uh, could have a place to sit when they visited. And you surely would not have been that casual as to place them on a daybed. You would have placed them on chairs. So that's the original uh, layout of the Barcelona Pavilion of 1929. But now we get to some, a really juicy point. And the, the woman we're looking at is Lily Reich. Again, some of you will know this name and perhaps know this history. It's interesting, and it's always a good question to ask. You know, Mies lived into the late 1960s. And the furniture we know of Mies van der Rohe, for the most part, is really is designed from the late 20s to the early 1930s. And you think, well, did he just get bored with furniture? Hmm, I wonder. He worked, some of you know exactly where I'm going, I believe. Um, Johnson, excuse me, Johnson, forgive me, Mies, um, uh, working in Berlin, uh, began to work with Lily Reich. Lily Reich, pictured here, uh, had studied in, the, in her early years with Josef Hoffmann. She uh, later worked with the uh, uh, Deutsche Werkbund and was trained in textiles and in design, obviously mind-blowingly talented, and she worked with Mies van der Rohe. And it's fascinating, when you look at the years in which she worked with Mies, was exactly when the furniture was being designed. And if you go to the archive of the Museum of Modern Art, I don't have pictures here, unfortunately, almost all the line drawings are signed by Lily Reich. So there's no question that the furniture that we think of as Mies van der Rohe is certainly done in coordination with Lily Reich. And the apartment that Philip Johnson has, we think of as being so masculine and so much, you know, an apartment for a bachelor, my goodness, that it was very much designed in part by Lily Reich and maybe even wholly by Lily Reich. So it's very, it's, you know, it's fascinating. And for some of you may not be familiar with that, and it's usually quite a surprise to learn that. I'd love to do even more of a talk on her. We'll talk, you know, next year, by the way, is the year of the International Year of the Woman. And I know some of my, my uh, my team is here, and we've been looking at how to coordinate that subject matter into our programming next year. But I think it is fascinating that so much of that we think of as being so this kind of heavy, mies stuff is due to Lily Reich. And this is an example of her work with Mies. Um, this is 1927 in Berlin. Um, those of you who can read German will see the word silk. This was the Velvet and Silk Cafe. Some of you may have seen about a few years ago at MoMA, this was somewhat recreated, uh, an area using uh, fabric curtains and Mies-designed uh, furniture. Um, and this was part of a trade show to celebrate German textiles, as well as the furniture design of Mies van der Rohe, or the studio of Mies van der Rohe. And this is very much considered to be a Lily Reich design, that use of curtains. And you'll see that as well in Johnson's apartment of 1930. So again, it's all very interesting. Here's the show of 1947. Johnson uh, comes, is at MoMA in the 1930s. He goes to um, a graduate school from 1940 to 1943, studies architecture at Harvard, serves in the, in the war from 43 to 45, and then comes back to MoMA. He does a retrospective of the work of Mies in 1947. The reason I want to pull that picture up is you see the image on the right that they're standing in front of. That is the Tugendhat House, and it's located in Brno, Czechoslovakia. Hence, the Bruneau chairs are chairs that were designed for the Tugendhat House. I don't say that 10 times fast. The Tugendhat House um, of, it was designed from 1928 to 1930. And again, Lily Reich is working with uh, Mies van der Rohe at the time. And just to go back for a second, the overall design of this exhibition 
uh, I was reading a scholar's notes on this, so it's not my research, but someone else's, was saying that the plan of that looks surprisingly similar to that of the Tuchenhot House. This is 1927. The Tuchenhot House is designed from 1928 to 1930. You're going to see some pictures. So again, going back to Philip Johnson. And let's see. And I just wanted to, talking about this 1947 show, Johnson says, after Harvard, I was drafted and served in the military. When I came back to New York and my work at MoMA, I began work on a show of Mises architecture. This opened in 47 and was the first solo show in the United States on Mies. I wrote the show's catalog, which included writings by Mies. By then, Mies had begun projects in America, such as the Farnsworth House and the campus of the Illinois Institute of Technology, but not yet the Seagram Building. And again, it's just important for me to note this because we're part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. For those of you who have not yet been to the Farnsworth House, it is owned by the National Trust. You can visit that. It's about 60 miles west of Chicago. And it's fascinating that at this show, the model for that is shown, and that's the original impetus that gets Johnson to design the glass house. The property here in Connecticut is purchased in 46. The designs are done from 47 to 48, and it opens in 1949. But now we got to talk about Bruneau. Now, this is a Bruneau chair, again, the tubular version. And that's a Bruneau chair with the flat arm version. And again, perfectly available at Knoll, but not the ones you're seeing here. Those are, again, from 1930. This is the Tuchentot house. And it doesn't look like the glass house, but it sure as heck has a lot of glass incorporated. I'll just give you a little background on the Tuchenhots. The Tuchenhots were a family, a very wealthy family in textiles uh, based in Brno. It was a Jewish family, and that's important because the house is completed in 1930. They only got to occupy the house for about eight years and then had to uh, flee uh, because of the encroachment of the Nazis. And later the Nazis took the house over, as did the communist regime in Czechoslovakia, and again, more on that later. But Johnson talking about this, about coming to see this in 1930, so the house is brand new. This is contemporary architecture. And he says, we were in Brno only 24 hours. We saw a wonderful house by Mies van der Rohe, who's doing my apartment. He has one room very low ceilinged, 100 feet long toward the south, all of glass from the ceiling to the very floor. I hope I got a, oh, that's not the right picture. Hold on, we're going to go back in a second. I want to see that. 100 feet long toward the south, all of glass from the ceiling, great sheets of plate glass that go into the floor, electric, he says electrically, but it's electronically. And this, so that's the top of the window. It comes down. Can you imagine in 1930? I know you can't hear me that well. That was an, had an electronic mechanism that allowed the plate glass to come down. This could not have been more modern if they tried. And what could else be so modern was this furniture. So I just want to go back for a second. So again, this is the house. And that's part of the interior. It has wonderful uh, expanses of wood, onyx, marble, uh, those beautiful polished uh, chrome uh, columns. Let's see. Oh, excuse me. Johnson said, the side of the room is at least 30 feet of glass to the east. The room is divided into dining room, library, and living room by partial walls, which do not in the least destroy the size, but rather magnify it. One wall is of onyx. It's cost already a million marks, which in Europe is a frightful sum. Oh, but a beautiful house. And looking at that furniture, you can tell those are what's known as Barcelona chairs in the back, but they're bright green. That's, these are, this, by the way, is not original furniture. The house, as I mentioned before, basically had been pillaged by the Nazis and then later pillaged by the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. And therefore, it was um, uh, it really left quite destitute uh, and only recently restored. The pictures here are not professional photos. They're ones that I snapped on my one visit there in 2012. It's now it was reopened to the public in 2012. And there was a use of color. That's leather. In That gr green color is actually leather. Quite extraordinary. And the chairs in the front are known as Tugendhat chairs. By the way, Johnson did have two of those. We have um, them two in storage. They're not in great shape. But again, they, you, if you look at that original apartment photograph, those are there. Again, there's what's known as a Barcelona table, but a slightly higher version, and that's the way it was done for Bruno. So again, whenever you see a Bruno chair, now you know it's coming from this house. And again, that fabulous view out. And this I've got to point out, and again, forgive me my Carol Merrill moment. Also designed by Mies, it has quite a history. 
It was at this table, which was found, uh, all the furniture had disappeared from the house, and it was all reassembled for the purposes of reopening to the public. But when Czechoslovakia was, was divided into the Czech Republic and into Slovakia, the political um, uh, uh, procedure, uh, the signing of the documents, took place at that table in this house. So it's quite a history. And again, this fabulous red chaise. By the way, there are definitely notes uh, in Lily Reich's handwriting of the design, especially of that curve of that chaise by Mies van der Rohe. And again, that fabulous red color. And by the way, how do you like that zebra wood? Gorgeous, huh? And the chair in the front, that's known as an MR chair. That's from the 1920s. That's an earlier design of Mies van der Rohe. Can everybody see? Oh, Bill, hey, how you doing? So, and you can see the Bruneau chairs in the back, a token hot chair towards the right, and then this MR chair in the front. And again, all of this is associated with the period of time that Lily Reich was in the studio of Mies van der Rohe. By the way, Lily Reich uh, came into the Bauhaus uh, kind of late in the day. In 1930, uh, Mies took over the Bauhaus. Again, it was started by Walter Gropius. Um, uh, he stepped down, I'm trying to remember my years, I think in 1928. Um, and from 1928 to 1930, Hannes Meyer ran the Bauhaus, and then Mies came in 1930, and it, it was closed down in 1933. So Lily Reich only was able to really run a department at the Bauhaus from 32 to 33. Unlike Mies, Gropius, um, uh, so many others, uh, um, uh, Lily Reich was, did not emigrate from Germany, and therefore she spent the war in Germany, and she died there in 1947. And again, just these beautiful, simple, simple rooms. Just gorgeous, right? Ready to move in. It's really been beautifully restored. I have to just give you a little quick background. Uh, the daughter of the Tuchenhots, who was not alive when this house was built, she was born in the 1940s, is now a fairly renowned art historian. She teaches in Vienna. And she and her husband, who is a specialist in restoration, Ivo Hammer, who's German, um, worked closely with the current owners, which is uh, the, the city of Brno, uh, to restore the house. And again, this is our MR table. So now you, when you see it, you'll understand that it really has quite a history. So there it is in Brno, and here it is in New Canaan. Now here we are with Johnson. Johnson at Harvard. We went a little bit uh, out of chronology. Johnson goes back to Harvard in 1940 to 1943 to study architecture. He's already been the founding director of architecture at MoMA. Would that be a little intimidating to either his professors or, his stu or the students, can you imagine? And of course, who's leading uh, the school is Walter Gropius. Uh, Marcel Breuer is teaching there. Uh, the Albers um, have spent time there. So there's, there's a lot of uh, extraordinary figures from the Bauhaus who are there. And it's interesting, at that time, Johnson builds a house for himself. Now, some of you have heard this described as the thesis house. I hope I've got the, oops, wrong picture. I'm getting ahead of myself, forgive me. Here he's, he's studying, and of course he's with Walter Gropius, Mr. Marcel Breuer. Of course, the reason Johnson ends up in New Canaan in part is because he's following Marcel Breuer uh, to New Canaan. It's exactly the time when he looks at property in 1945 is when Breuer is building his first building here. And Johnson is thinking about, while he's at Harvard, and of course he knows Mies, he's looking at Mies's work for, in, for influence of something that he could design. And this is a, 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 a project in 1938 for a series of houses known as courthouses. And this is an example of it from 1932, the Lemke House. And here's the house that Johnson designs. And again, I was getting ahead of myself. It's known as the thesis house. Uh, certainly at Harvard, they refer to it as that. But it's really not quite correct. As Johnson corrected me, he said, well, it became my thesis. Johnson built this for himself while he was a student. It was built in 1942. He graduates in 43. And in 1943, he submits it as his thesis. And he does graduate. <laughs> not so bad. And he says, about, about, this is known as, it's really known as Astrid. If, if Johnson were here, he would have referred to it that way. And he says, Mies greatly influenced my early designs. I'd inherited Mies as an influence, just as Mies had inherited Carl Friedrich Schinkel. And again, most, many of you will know that uh, reference, but Schinkel, a uh, great 19th century architect, particularly known for exquisitely done brickwork. And you'll see a lot of brickwork in early works of Mies. And Johnson says, the great romantic period architect. My first house was based on Mies's concept for a city dwelling that incorporates a private garden. There we go, got the right picture finally. And you can see the garden is even bigger than the floor plan of the house. That's the garden in the front. It's a prototype in a way for the glass house. 
and you have the house at the back, and you can see all the furniture, you know. small building. This building has quite a provenance. Of course, it was owned by Johnson. He later sells it in, when he comes back from the war, uh, he serves from 43 to 45, he starts looking at land here, realizes he's not going back, going back to Cambridge and instead wants to build in New Canaan, and he sells the house. It only changes hands a few times, and for an extended period of time, it's owned by the, um, the great constitutional scholar, Lawrence Tribe, who owned a mansion next door and he and his family restored it, became his private um, study. It's a very interesting kind of history. And here's an example. So again, you see the furniture. It's, it has a whole new life. This is 1942, so Johnson's already had that furniture for 12 years. Quite incredible. Let's see. Oh, and, just, and he says, I'd returned there two years before to study architecture at Harvard, meaning in 1942. So looking back at that project, I see how I violated some of Mises' design principles. For example, my roof has an overhang. Let me see if I can get back to the roof picture. You can see it actually struts out right there. And of course, make sure I'm, I'm not stepping on his words. It's not flush with the wall. But at that time, I thought it was keeping close to his ideas. And so it's an interesting thing that Johnson is absorbing Mies, but still um, making it his own. And certainly a prototype for the glass house. Again, Bruneau chairs, a simple table, the MR chair in the back, and the MR table. very nice in the winter. Johnson mentioned that you know, he originally had an idea to have a water feature in the garden and realized that, by the way, it definitely freezes in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and maybe that was a bad idea. And just now we've moved on to the glass house. So you have a better understanding of where the glass house's design really comes from, um, as well as the, um, uh, where the, how long this furniture had been part of Johnson's life and terms, in terms of his history. And just to kind of, I know you guys know this all too well, but the glass house, of course, now I think that a whole assemblage makes sense. As Johnson said, he said, this is a 1920s house, meaning Mies had started doing courthouses as early as that. And the furniture really is furniture of the late 20s, early 1930s. And I should just point out, of course, the picture is a work by, uh, attributed to Nicolas Poussin, and it was originally acquired uh, for Johnson by Alfred Barr and it hung in their offices at MoMA in 1947 while this house was being built. Again, the Bruneau chair, our Barcelona chairs, Barcelona ottoman, that's all legit, you can call that Barcelona. And again, the Bruneau chairs around a table that's designed by Philip Johnson. This is one of the few things where, yes, he said, no, use the masterworks, why reinvent the spoon, but he clearly wanted to make a table that never went into production. I just want to point out that every once in a while there is something new that's introduced. It's not all from the 1930 apartment. This lamp, uh, which it was done with uh, Richard Kelly, uh, the great lighting designer, is co-designed with Philip Johnson. But it works very nicely. And again, Johnson's sort of making this his own while still being very much an ode to Mies van der Rohe. And I just want to point out that Johnson didn't solely remain in that Miesian uh, vein uh, in 1953, which is really his first break uh, from traditional international style modern, he redoes the interior of the brick house, and you know I'm going to go there. And of course, we're work looking to raise money to restore the brick house. I've got to throw that out there. But this interior is redone by Johnson in 1953, and it's really the first example of Johnson moving into a historical reference with those arches, and of course, there's no Miesian furniture to be seen there. And that brings you back, though, to the original main portion of the glass house, which Johnson so loved. Believe me, there's literally marks on the floor, so we know where to place the furniture. There's no like moving it an extra three inches this way or that way. Uh, the ghost of Philip Johnson will shoot me on the spot if I do that. But again, I think it gives you a greater sense. Of course, melded with southern New England, with that extraordinary landscape. Johnson fell in love with this property because of the promontory upon which it sits. And it's really that combination of amazing Bauhaus history merged with the mid-century modern uh, that we have here in New Canaan. And here we are with Johnson. And don't worry, I am winding up. I know, I know how much time I was, I was allotted. 
Uh, but Johnson, of course, reflected somewhat about his experiences with Mies, as well as his experiences in the house. And writing, actually, in 1930, he talks about Mies van der Rohe, and he says, Mies is the greatest man we or I have met. Oud, I like better, and this is not Oud, this is Mies van der Rohe standing above the design for Crown Hall at the Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, the school at which he taught when he left Germany. But, and Johnson's talking about J.J.P. Oud, the great modern architect in, um, in Rotterdam. He says, Oud I like better, I almost love Oud. Such a dear man he is, besides being a genius, but Mies is a great man. He keeps his distance and impersonality at all times, only letting down graciously once in a while, thus honoring you as the nod of a god would. We drove him down to Dessau and back the other day, and he's writing this in 1930, and so could talk to him a lot. His point of view on architecture is ours, the point of view which very few architects have in Germany. He is pure architect, excuse me, he is a pure architect, not mixed up with too many theories. And then Johnson, towards the end of his life, this is a shot from 2001. But it's interesting, in talking to Johnson, he always was adamant, absolutely adamant, that people should be uh, respectful of their own time, that the greatness of any period is important to know about and perhaps celebrate, in his case, live with, but you shouldn't stop there. And so I'm going to give the final words to, to Philip Johnson, as I certainly was wont to do. And he says, it's important to celebrate great artists like Mies, but it's even more important to develop new ideas in architecture. And I hope I don't get anybody upset with this one. Modernism has maintained a hold on the design world that has lasted longer than so many other artistic movements. How long did the Renaissance last? Not 70 years. Modernism is a historic style. And I know I'd get shot at Harvard for saying that out loud, but nonetheless, Johnson says, modernism is a historic style. By the time Mies completed the Seagram building, his ideas we're over 30 years old. And with that, I will be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. And come see the glass house, please. I'm just curious, do we have any questions? Have I exhausted you with that? So many, oh yes, Kevin, hello sir, how are you? Professor Gray, how are you? Thank you for your talk. Sure. Yeah, hiding behind my mic. My professor always said Bauhaus was the custard manufacturing of things that looked like they were mass produced. Oh, that's an interesting was statement. Was there a goal that these things would be available to everybody? Absolutely. There's really two parts to the Bauhaus, Kevin. It's really it's a fascinating question. I'm glad you brought it up. The Bauhaus, when it started, the ethos under Gropius was really to produce things that were handcrafted and that the greatness of, of that kind of creation, but still in a modern vein. And it became clear, certainly by the time the Bauhaus opens, reopens in Dessau, that it's too darn expensive to produce stuff like that, because the goal was for these things to be available uh, to the public, but if you were making everything handcrafted, that wasn't going to work that well. So there was a movement within the Bauhaus, starting in the mid-20s, again, under Gropius, to get closer to the machine made, but that wasn't the initial ethos, and so it's a fascinating kind of shift. So I think your professor was onto something for sure. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? Any questions about like where you can get a good sale at Knoll? Bill, <laughs> forgive me. Oh, Bill, why don't you wait one second? Just this gentleman right here. Sure. Take a quick sip. From when yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The yeah. Known, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. the the at Harvard in the 1940s. I've met others um, who knew him at Harvard at the time, and they told me exactly the same story. And I should address this. I mean, uh, it's something that, as you know, has been in the press, and we have discussed uh, in programming here at the, at the Glass House. But Johnson, indeed, in the late 1930s, uh, maintained and publicly maintained uh, political views that I think most of us would find absolutely despicable and heinous in his support for the Nazis. And I'd had uh, the opportunity to discuss some of this with him, not uh, maybe not as fully as one would have liked, but it's my understanding 
that Johnson at the time was so kind of swayed by what he felt was the greatness of Germany that he saw uh, at the time of the Depression that this might have, uh, that there might have been some political and economic answers uh, under what was rising in Germany at the time. Now, I think those of us today looking back on this will not find that description very acceptable, to say the least. I do know this. Johnson, uh, in later years, of course, I don't think you can fully recant that, but he certainly um, was highly apologetic and did not maintain those views. And as he said on the Charlie Rose show, and forgive me for bringing up Charlie Rose, because I know he has his own issues. <laughs> I always liked that show so much. He had such great interviews with Johnson. But I remember he, uh, Rose was asking Johnson about, you know, well, I, I assume you weren't much of a supporter for Roosevelt. He said, really? He said, I voted for him four times. So Johnson was complicated, but he did fall absolutely enamored of all things German during the 1920s and the 1930s, which unquestionably was a problematic time. So thank you for that question, sir. Bill, I think you were going to ask a question. Yes. Yeah, that is a replacement one. Okay, now, is the one in this apartment that meets the job? The 1931, there's no picture of it there, that's true. Okay. Yep. So when does that appear? My gut tells me that he buys that for the glass house, because I don't see pictures of it also in Ash Street, which is 1942. And I'm going to guess he's kind of busy from 43 to, uh, from, yeah, 43 to 45, because he is serving in the U.S. military. That's my guess, but I don't know for sure. And so it's one of my colleagues from the Glass House. Maybe the education team will help me do some research because I'm serious. I'm not sure. There's no question that the Barcelona table is part of the design of the Glass House that is, as it appears in 1949. When that actual table is acquired, I honestly don't know, and I'm dumbfounded about it. So I'm going to do some research. The photo that you showed of the Barcelona table did not have that. No, it did. That's why it's known as a Barcelona table. The only thing I'm questioning of Barcelona is the daybed, because there was no daybed. But yes, there was a Barcelona table in the Barcelona pavilion. The, the, same height the, the Tuchenhat, Tuchenhat one is a little higher, I believe. And the I don't know if it was made in, in more than those two versions. By the way, again, just as backdrop, you know, again, this is all being done in Germany in Mises' studio. Uh, Noel gets the license, I believe it's 1947 or 1948. So it's definitely a post-war. Uh, period that they license the designs of Mies van Rohe. But we're going to research that. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Are you ready for supper? Karen. I'm, I'm, I'm a little ready for supper. One thing. Talking about his time, his sympathy with fascism, but yes. the Bauhaus had, I believe, some very positive ethical concerns. Oh, yes. Oh yeah, Bauhaus was shut down by the, by, the, uh, by the Nazis. The Nazis hated modern architecture and hated modern design, absolutely. So, so it's a little complicated. Is it fair to think that Johnson was initially seduced by the more positive? Oh, I see what you mean. I think probably yes. Listen, it, it, he described it in a number of ways. He also talked about it philosophically in the sense that Johnson was a student of philosophy um, and he, he admitted that he was very much a Nietzschean. He was definitely had proclivities towards a powerful figure. Um, some of us would find that a bit more offensive today, and but it's certainly something that we have seen within the world today. There are many people who are seduced by the idea of a strong figure, especially in a troubled time. So that is, I think that's part of it, Karen, but thank you for asking that. But it's, it's an also an in interesting point. The Bauhaus, which he so loved, and modern architecture and modern art, which he so loved, was absolutely despised by the Nazis. So that's, it's probably, Johnson was complex. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, what did Johnson do during the um, as he described it, he peeled potatoes and cleaned latrines. I think it was also, as the gentleman pointed out, it was not an unknown thing that he had had German sympathies uh, during the 1930s. He had published some articles. Uh, there, there was plenty of reason for him to get beaten up as a young soldier. And frankly, in those days, it certainly would not have been very uh, easy to have been uh, open with one's um, orientation. Uh, and so I imagine he got uh, taken to task many, many times. So he was not, he did not have a good time, but he served stateside. Remember, he wasn't that young a man at that time. In 1943, Johnson's 37 years old. I wouldn't mind being 37 right now, I'd be fine. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That sounds young, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, no. You were, yes, ma'am. You mean at the Bauhaus? 
The bow, no, the Bauhaus building actually was not destroyed, and you can go visit it. As I, I, I'm so glad you actually raised this question. In, um, uh, you know, it's the 100th year of the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus is easy to visit. And um, if you really want to go wild, you can even stay overnight and be in really in Spartan pleasure in one of the dorm rooms that are, that are decorated with Bauhaus furniture. But um, it's located about an hour and 45 minutes outside of Berlin. And you can just take a commuter train and go there. So it's fascinating to visit it. And it's still a functioning school, which is very, very interesting. And so the main building is still operated. Um, but uh, I mean, there was so much destruction during the war. It's a good question. Were some of the modern houses destroyed? You know, that's a great question, and I don't have the answer to it. But I don't know of any examples of that. Goodness knows plenty of destruction took place, and a good chunk of Berlin uh, was absolutely devastated, as was uh, much of Germany. Thank you for the question. Anything else I can respond? Yes, ma'am. The Glass House, I believe it is. You know, I've not read that novel, but I will tell you, the Tuchanot House is absolutely stupendous. There's a fascinating film that came out, I want to say it was maybe 2012 or 2014, uh, that was made by a Czech group. You're nodding, perhaps you've seen it. I saw that. It was actually screened at, I think it was the Jewish Film Festival at Lincoln Center, because it had such a strong theme about the uh, the need to flee from the Nazis and the history of the Tuchenhaut family. Um, but it's an incredible house, because it was built to be this stunning, uh, large-scale, um, uh, modern home that was just a showcase for Mies van der Rohe, infinitely larger than uh, the Barcelona Pavilion, which is a little pavilion, or the Farnsworth House, a little country house. But this is for a grand family in Brno. Um, and so there's been lots of speculation. But I believe, again, I had not read that novel, but I think that is a fictional account related to the house, if I believe. Oh, no, we read right after we were architects. Ah. Uh, no, I believe it's Mies. I believe it's Mies. But I need to read that, so thank you for the reminder. Yeah. Any other questions? Is it time for supper? It probably is. Thank you so much. <laughs>